And we've been <clears throat> talking about Melchizedek, and uh, we spent the last two classes getting into this difference between the two priesthoods. <clears throat> and we saw that there is a very abrasive contrast between um, the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek priest, and how few people really understand what it means to be a New Testament priest, or you could put it in this way, what it means to be a Melchizedek priest, and what that really involves, and what's it all about. <clears throat> well, last class, we, we made a distinction between the two priesthoods, and we used these terms. We said one of them is a, um, a mediator priest, and that would be the Levitical priesthood, and the Melchizedek priest is a communion priesthood. <clears throat> we, we did a little bit of explaining on that, but we didn't really fully get into it. And so I want to do that tonight, and I want to do that directly out of the first scriptures that even talk about Melchizedek, Genesis chapter 14. And... Uh, And we'll read uh, beginning in verse 17, Genesis 14, 17. <clears throat> and this is, as I said, the first mention of Melchizedek. Doesn't really have a whole lot to say, but this is really the foundation where we're going to begin to understand and the light can dawn upon what this priesthood is all about and why God established the Melchizedek priesthood as his eternal priesthood. Now you do remember that it says of Melchizedek, the priest, and it was not just speaking of the man but of his priesthood, that he was without beginning and without end of days. That's important to understand because it's in there that you begin to realize that this priesthood is the one that God had in mind all along, okay? That this, pri this priest that was without beginning of days and without end had always been the priesthood that God uh, had established. And there's an important factor in that, and that is to realize that before the world was, since this is a priest without beginning, there was no sin. This is a communion priesthood. And when sin is all dealt with and gone, Melchizedek will still be a priest, or this priesthood will still continue on. What is an eternal priest? That's the question. <clears throat> We begin to see some of this right here in Genesis 14, beginning with verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, speaking of uh, Abraham, and the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer. And the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine brought forth bread and wine notice the very next words and he was the priest of the most high God he brought forth bread and wine he was the priest of the most high God and he blessed him and said blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. <clears throat> so in those few verses, that's basically, I mean, that's basically everything other than Psalm 110 mentions Melchizedek in one phrase, one verse, that is basically 
the presentation to us of the Melchizedek priesthood. But behind it is incredible reality that the, only the Holy Spirit will open to us. I remember when I was in Bible school and I remember I read about Melchizedek and read in Hebrews the Melchizedek priesthood and I thought, man, I, I really need to know about this. And I remember studying these scriptures in Genesis and going, how are we ever supposed to get anything out of this? You know, there's so little information here. And yet, the information is here, but you have to see it in the context in which the whole thing begins to take place. And to do that, you've got to go back to chapter 13. <clears throat> so if you'll turn there with me, Genesis 13. Genesis 13 and verse 5. And Lot also went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram, uh, the herdsmen of Abram's cattle, and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. Let there be no strife. I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. These are all important factors that's going to play into the appearance of Melchizedek. And verse 9, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. <clears throat> so there was, as it were, spiritual warfare. There was strife. There was attacks going on in relationship to Lot and his herdman, herdsmen and Abraham and his. They were, as it says, brethren. Now, of course, Lot really wasn't his brother, but was his nephew. But they were brethren. And uh, there was this strife that had built up. And, you know, strife leads to division. And division, if not dealt with, will lead to separation. Now, you can be assured of that. You can know that if you've got strife in your heart, it's going to lead to division. And if you let it continue, it will lead to separation. And that's exactly what happened with Lot. And so uh, Lot separated himself, it says. And Lot separated himself. He pulled out from Abram, and he did that based on Number one, it says there was strife. It doesn't tell us the nature of the strife, and I always think, I always like those kind of things um, where it doesn't tell you the specific thing because we think it's all wrapped up in the specific incidences and the, the situation and what specifically is going wrong. But I'm telling you, with Lot, Lot was, uh, he had division in his heart because he was not as Abraham. And so there had to be separation if there was going to be this. And so he uh, separated. <clears throat> Abraham gave no resistance. He just, you know, told Lot, you know, take what you want. And so Lot, the Bible says he lifts up his eyes 
um, verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of the Jordan. What did he behold? He beheld all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou come to Zor. Then, when Lot lifted up his eyes and looked, he looked for the best part. Does that sound like anybody you know? Have you bumped into him in the mirror lately? <laughs> Where we choose what looks best. We want the best. And we choose, oh, this, oh well, this is, this is going to be the best route. This is going to be the best way. And we, cho we choose what we think is going to be the best thing. And so it says, when he saw that, then Lot chose him. He chose him for him all the plain of the Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves one from the other. It clearly says Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Again, this all will have great bearing on why in the world Melchizedek appeared where he appeared in the Bible. Why not, you know, earlier or later? Or I mean, he's a, he's a priest without beginning or without end. Why right here? And these, these elements are part of the whole story that began to help us to see exactly what was going on. Lot wanted a better land, and that's, you know, he wants a better living situation. And I'm telling you folks, I'm just going to tell you straight up, Abraham knew God, and he dwelt in a lot of places in that land, but he was content wherever he was at because his portion was the Lord. And I'm telling you that a lot of people that are Christians, their portion is what the Lord will give them. Their portion is what they can get from the Lord. Their portion is not the Lord himself. And the proof of that comes when there comes division and strife and they start looking for something better. Something in the earth. A portion of land in the earth that's going to, quote unquote, satisfy their needs. And in this case, what did it do? It moved Lot and all that were of him toward Sodom. That's, it didn't look bad at the time. It looked good. Did anybody hear what I said? If you're going to judge by the knowledge of good and evil, you can choose good and end up with evil too because it's off the same tree. And if your choice is going to be good, you're already wrong. You're choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Patty and Mike, this belongs to your neighbor, uh, Rob uh, Proctor. Could y'all see that he gets that for me? Thank you. And so um, he moved toward the better place. The Bible says he pitched his tent toward Sodom. <clears throat> So this embrace and search for, you know, more amiable conditions, something that looks better and feels better, eventually led to Lot's own captivity. It is the thing that led to his captivity. Um, I, since I'm searching there and will probably be sharing in Ireland along this line, it reminds me of the book of Ruth that starts out with famine in God's land. Famine in God's land, and so they go looking for a better place, and that better place was called Moab. And in Moab, they lost, she lost her husband, she lost her sons, she lost everything. However, in that land of famine, there was a guy named Boaz, and he stuck through the famine, and when he came out on the other side, he was the guy with all the fields. <laughs> you know. We are so caught up in this world and in how things look and trying to find the best thing. And I'm telling you, finding the Lord is all that counts. 
and nothing else counts, and I would rather stick with the Lord and everything be bad than have something good and not have the Lord. You know? Uh, there, there's an old saying when it comes to tithing and giving. You know, it's, it's, uh, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather have 90% or I'd rather, you know, give 10%. I'd rather have 90% with God's blessing than 100% without it. Well, forget money and tithing. I would rather be with the Lord no matter where, no matter what, and say that and not say it as a doctrine, but in my heart be settled that you know what? There's going to be a lot of ups and downs. There's going to be a lot of hard things. But I would rather be with my Jesus because if I'm with him, it's still okay. But if I'm not with him, woe is me because I don't have him. And then, and then you pitch your tent towards Sodom and you end up in captivity there. You leave the promised land because there's famine and you head towards Moab, and you end up losing everything anyway. I mean, I'd rather give Jesus everything than just have it all lost because of my foolishness. And in my heart, and, and I say this not anything, but in my heart, there's only one thing to live for, and that's Jesus. In my heart, I don't care how, I, I understand that there's going to be tough times. I want to prove to you that Jesus is faithful by me being faithful to you in tough times. I mean, you know, everyone else heads for the hills, you know. But I want to be a living demonstration of Christ, of his life and of his way. So Abraham knows something that Lot doesn't know. He knows something that Lot doesn't know. Abraham says, you know, look, the whole land, I mean, look at this big land. The whole land is before you. Pick out whatever you want. And Lot goes, oh, I'm going to take the good land. Well, here's us. What is he doing taking the good land? I was hoping he wouldn't take that. I was going to build a summer cottage down there. <laughs> or something. You know, I mean, that's, the, that's us. But Abraham didn't go through that at all. Because God, previous to this, just in the chapter before this, had told him, the whole land is yours. And he knew it was, he didn't, have to have, he didn't have a deed. There were a lot of foreigners in that land that had been there way before Abraham was. So you're either going to have faith and believe in God, or you're going to go by what you see or the circumstances or whatever, and you're going to freak out, and you're going to say, well, you know, why did Lot choose that? I wanted that. Well, just watch what happens. Just... Just give everything a little bit of time. And we'll see. We'll see what happens. You know. Because you can, you know, I mean, Abraham's friend there, you know, because he had some, and it, we'll mention those as we read later on, that were in the land. Could have said, well, that was a dumb move, Abraham. And Abraham's going, no, it's all mine. God gave it to me. He gave it to me by promise. I don't have to fight for it. Did anybody hear what I just said? I don't have to fight for it. I don't have to. Why? Why would I want to fight for what's already mine? You fight when you don't believe. See? And that's, that's the key. <clears throat> so, just like Elimelech and Naomi, they left what clearly was God to get something in this earth better. All right. So now look at the result with Abraham, verse 14. Now this is right after, like verse 10, Lot lifted his eyes and beheld all this good land. Verse 14, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it into thy seed forever. Lot lifted up his eyes and looked at the good part. God said, Abraham, lift up your eyes. It's all yours. It's all yours. 
he didn't just say it's yours. He said, I want you to lift up your eyes and look at all of it. North, south, it's all yours. I gave it to you. Um, verse 16, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. <clears throat> now, let's go ahead and drop down to chapter 14, verse 1, because I'm trying to get to this Melchizedek part, but I, all this is important. And it came to pass in the days of uh, Amraphel, Amre king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Chedilomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. Okay, now these are, these are some pretty powerful sounding kings here. That these made war with Barak, king of Sodom. Okay, so let me, before I read any further, let me just paint this picture for you. <clears throat> there are these four kings here, and they are making war with kings that are in the promised land. One of them is the king of Sodom. The other one is, as we read on, with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and uh, Shemerber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt sea. Listen to this. Twelve years they served Chedilomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Chedilomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephim, the Ashtaroth, Karnim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Eminem, oh, I'm sorry, Emim, in uh, whatever that name is there. <clears throat> All right. So for twelve years in the Promised Land, there were these five kings who served Chedilomer who was outside of the land, and they gave, tie, uh, they gave uh, tribute and all of this to him. But in the 13th year, they decided, we've had enough. The king of Sodom, along with these other, we've had enough, and they rebelled. Okay? So Chedilomer comes down, with, and he gets these other kings, and he comes down, and they just defeat every, every one of these guys. Just, it, it doesn't even sound like they had any problem at all. Just marched right on through. Not only that, there's some hard names here, but it's important to, to hear what's going on. Look at verse 6. Uh, it says they defeated so-and-so, and then the Horites in the Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness, and they returned and came to in Mispar, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites. Anybody think that's a little strange? Since Israel was scared to even enter in the land. And this is years later because of these Amalekites. And it's making it sound like Chedilomer and his group is just sweeping right through anybody that's in their way. And all of these people are in the promised land, all these kings. Um, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazaron Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboam and the king of Bela, the same as Zor, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim with Chedilomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they and talking about Chedilomer and his group, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supplies and went their way, and they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. All right. So Lot, I don't know how long he'd been in Sodom. First of all, he, did, he pitched his tent towards Sodom, and then he ended up living there. Because that's the way it works. If your government's out of whack with the Lord, you're going to fit right in with the evil kingdom and empires of this world. You will. You'll be drawn to it because that's your motivation. You're just like somebody else that's working a job, you know, uh, you know, doing overtime and doing all this stuff and never coming home, never getting any time with their kids or anything else like that. You're only doing that simply to improve to have a car that you don't own, the bank does. To have a nice house that you don't own, the bank does. And to buy a lot of stuff on credit that, you know, plastic will soon have that all taken away. 
And so he ends up in Sodom, and then he ends up with the captivity of Sodom. All right. Now, Abraham, and think about this. Abraham is watching this whole thing. I mean, he's in the land, and God had just a few verses above this told him the whole land is his. Am I right or wrong? But he's sort of like, I sort of picture him sitting on this hill watching these kings, these four kings come sweeping in and defeat these five kings and then sweep over this side and wipe out all these kings, including the Amalekites, and then going back over here and taking the Amorites and just, and then their last sweep through Sodom and Gomorrah and taking them and carrying them away captive and just sitting there. And he's not, he's not jumping up going, hey, you can't do that, you know. You don't get a sense that he's freaking out over any of this. He seems almost detached from the whole thing. I mean, it, you know, this is, this is war. This is the way people are, you know. I mean, they put them in bondage and they rebel. It's all one big, ugly family. <laughs> so, but Abraham's just watching it. And he's unmoved by the whole thing. The whole land's mine. It don't matter who fights over it. Right? So he's just watching it until the next verse. And there came one that had escaped. Isn't it funny that only one escaped and he headed for Abraham? And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite's brother of Eskel, the Amorite, brother of Eskel, and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. I told you, he had some people that were, even though they were Amorites and whatever, he had some people that were confederate with him. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. All right, so here's the picture. Abraham's watching this war going on that's just happening all over the land. And all of a sudden, this guy who escapes comes running up to Abraham and said, Lot is with them. <coughs> Lot was taken captive. Now, all of a sudden, Abraham goes, okay, get the men. Now, you got five kings. One of them is called Title, King of Nations. Get my 300 men. You know? My armed servants. <laughs> when they're not, you know, armed, they're just servants. <laughs> ah, but they're serving together with the man who has faith in the living God. And so they rise up, verse 14, and uh, verse 15, and he divided his men against them and he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. All right, so Lot, I mean, uh, Abraham's in this situation. <clears throat> He's not, Abraham's not thinking, I'm a great man of God with great courage, and I'm going to defeat the armies of the enemy. That, I hear that so much in Christianity. It's just, it's just pride and arrogance. Abraham is thinking one thing. I need to enforce the word of God. God told me this land was mine. That's all. I don't deserve it. I'm not a great man. I got nothing to be boastful about in myself but God said and I'm sticking with what God said now guess what God will back up your 300 hmm? God will back up your 300 so he goes down there and wipes them out what was Abraham's motivation Whatever his motivation was, this is the basis for the appearance of Melchizedek. This is now we're going to discover 
Why did Melchizedek show up all of a sudden? Why at this juncture? Why did this thing take place? Very next verse, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedilomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. All right. So, all of these places have been wiped out by this Chedilomer that came into the land. Wiped out and everything taken captive. I mean, it's one thing to pay tribute. It's another thing to lose your your home and your family and your children and all your goods and he just takes it all and leaves you with nothing. So Abraham, you know, and these guys are fighting. They're all these kings gathered together in the, you know, this veil fighting them and they all lose. Abraham gets 300 men, goes down there and defeats them and who starts showing up? Well, one person that starts showing up is the king of Sodom. He's the first one mentioned. He goes, hey man, uh, you know, Appreciate you doing this. You know, a lot of that stuff's mine. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, and, you know, you can take, uh, he says, you know, certain things here we'll read in just a second. But, I mean, you know, you know, you can take so-and-so, but we just want, you know, the women and children or whatever. You know, I mean, you won a great battle and everything. We just, we just like certain little things here. But he wasn't the only king that showed up. I would assume all of the kings in that whole area showed up to talk to Abraham about getting their stuff back. But there's one king among them named Melchizedek. And he was a king too. And apparently his stuff got stolen too, though it doesn't mention that or or doesn't, you know. And... Here it says, verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He was the priest, not of God, but of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God. And let's see, if you drop down, um, verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons that, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from Uh, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. All right, so before this time, Abraham had never met the Most High God, or at least had never been formally introduced to the concept. He had met El Shaddai, he had met, he had met God in so, in so many forms compared to most people. I mean, it, the, many of the introductions of the names of God is with Abraham. But all of a sudden, God doesn't appear to him. The Most High's priest appears to him and says, The Most High sent me with bread and wine. So, you know, there is a necessity to meet the priest of the Most High God. There is a necessity. And why? Because this priest knows who the Most High is. He knows who the Most High is. You may know things. You may even know him, but you don't know him as the priest is about to introduce him so that you can nail it, so that you can go, that's it. That's, that's it right there. New Testament priest, by the way. We are priests after the order of Melchizedek. Don't forget that. This isn't just a story. This is an explanation of us. So, Um, Melchizedek blessed God 
He blessed God for delivering Abram's enemies into his hands. Right? Verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, the most high God, through us from heaven and earth. Um, verse 20. And blessed, blessed be the most high God, who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Now the question is, was Chedilomer Abraham's enemy? And the answer is, no. Abraham, I, the picture I gave you, Abraham sat on the hill and watched Chedilomer and all those guys go right through his own land and wipe out everybody and didn't flinch and didn't jump up and in one instant did not move, did not say, you're my enemy. You've come and taken all our stuff. It wasn't his stuff. That was the devil's stuff, if you will. It was Sodom and Gomorrah's stuff. It was their stuff. He didn't. Abram, there is not one iota of a thread of information that Chedilomer was his enemy. Who was his enemy? Folks, Lot was his enemy. Lot was the one who had strife in his heart. Lot was the one who divided. Lot was the one who separated. Lot was the one who chose the best part of what, what belonged to Abraham. Lot was the one who, who eventually formed the country, Moab, that Naomi and Elimelech went to eventually and lost everything. That came out of this guy named Lot who slept with his daughters. That's where it came from. Lot was, a, though he was a brother, he was a grave enemy to the very spirit and nature of the God that Abram knew and served and loved. And what happened? Blessed be God, says the priest, who hath delivered your enemies into your hands, because here's the bottom line. Abraham, the biggest strife and the biggest turmoil he had, and then the biggest one you'll ever have is when it's in the house. There can be outside forces, but when it's in the house, it's, it hurts deeper, it's worse. Okay, civil war is worse than any war. I'll just put it like that, you know. And so here's Lot, and Lot's got wrong motivation, and he, he left, you know, he left uh, Babylon with Abram, followed him, and now he's striving and, and, and having problems with him and stuff like that. So that brings about a separation. And so Abraham could have sat on that hill, and that guy came and said, uh, these guys have wiped out everything. And not only that, but they took Lot captive. And Abraham, if he was like us and did not know the Most High, the Most High God would have said, praise God, he got what he deserved. That's right. You could see that coming. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, you know, I, this was sure to happen. I mean, there, I mean, it's just a matter of time till it ended this way. That would have been everybody else. That would have been everybody who does not know the Most High God. But Abraham said, I don't care what he's done to me. I don't care how much division and strife he's caused in my own home. I don't care the accusations of strife that, and division that have flown back and forth between me and him, between my herdsmen and him. He's in trouble, and I'm coming to help him. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to lay down my own resources. I'm going to take everything I got, and I'm going to use it to help him. Now, you, you couldn't have done that beforehand. Abraham could have come down to Lot, knocked on his door, and said, Hey, I just want to bless you, and, you know, I want to help you, and all this kind of stuff, and Lot who already had division and strife would have said, I don't need your help. Get out of here. There's something wrong with you. That's why I moved out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He, the, he couldn't have done it. 
But now, now, Lot's in captivity. And Abraham says, now I can show the spirit that I have in my heart for him. We call it what? The spirit of the Lamb. The most high God. The one that possesses heaven and earth, regardless of who has, has hold of it at the moment possess it all if, if it's the lamb was not the lamb raised up made to sit on the throne of the universe and possesses heaven and earth folks the lamb is the one that possesses heaven and earth and still does through us even though it may not look like we not we we don't yet see all things under our feet but it is done it's just like the same promise to abraham same exact promise and so abraham says this is you know, this is my opportunity. I want to go help him. I want to pour out my life. I don't care. Somebody says, what if, what, if, what if you get killed in battle? What if you lose half of your men or more? What if, I, what if I do? This is the right spirit. This is the right thing to do. And I don't care how it looks or what people think. I'm going to help right now. And so he did it. And he's, he's finished this thing. He laid down his life. His heart was right. He put others first. And all of a sudden, this king, this priest shows up and says, I got some communion here. Do you know what communion is, folks? Communion is when two people sit down and eat the same thing. They're eating, they're fellowshipping and eating the same thing. You see, Abraham had been eating the lamb. And the priest of the Most High God said, this is it. This is it. There's somebody that's already eating this thing. Let's go have communion. A communion priest is what we call him. Communion priest. Folks, that's the eternal spirit. The eternal spirit is the spirit of the Lamb, the spirit of self-giving. The eternal spirit that was before time is this lamb doesn't require sin, doesn't require a devil, doesn't require uh, the world out of control. It is the self-giving, life-giving spirit. Life-giving meaning giving it gives its life. It is a life-giving spirit. And when it's all said and done, who's sitting on the throne? The lamb, because he's a life-giving spirit. Now, you can't commune unless this life has been made flesh. Because even the very elements, bread and wine, represent that which was made flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It represents his body and his blood. That's, that's God coming and saying, I can commune with you. I'm sending the priest. I'm not sending a priest of, of another category or section or subject or, or doctrine. I'm sending the one from the most high God and I want to sit down and commune with you in this spirit. Have bread and wine. Well, anybody recognize another, another priest who sat down with bread and wine? Jesus. But there was a difference and I had mentioned this in our, one of our last classes, that a communing priest does th two things. You either commune on a one-to-one -one basis because you're both already eating of the same thing and you agree in it and you have fellowship in it, or you sit down and he feeds you like he did on, at the Last Supper. He feeds those who are not living that life yet, his flesh and his blood. It's one or the other. You're either communing in it or he's feeding it to you. In this case, folks, it was communion. He was communing. And he said, I want you to know who the Most High God is. I want to introduce you to the one that you've been living according to and let you understand that this isn't just um, El Shaddai or, or El, El Elohim. I can't remember all the names, all the stuff. Uh, all the different names. This... This is the most high. It's not going to get any higher than this right here. And he wants you, wants, he wants 
to fellowship with you over this thing. Let's have communion. See, that's what was in Jesus' heart. I have with much anticipation wanted to have this communion with you, he said to his disciples. Oh, for the time when he's not just put it, trying to put it in us by getting us to eat it, but he is communing with us because we're already eating it. Here, have what I'm eating. You're already eating it too, and let's fellowship in this thing. And so in, in the last part of this uh, course, we're going to get into the, um, uh, the priests and how they were consecrated. And it's going to be an amazing thing how it runs exactly along with this Melchizedek thing, this whole spirit. All right. So it takes flesh and blood to commune with a living God in this way, to eat his flesh, to drink his blood. And Jesus, I mean, it's poured out blood. It's broken bread. It's the cross. It's lamb do you understand what communion is now? That's what it is. It's not just his body. It's his broken body. For you, for others. It's not just blood, you know. It's not just blood in your veins. Why isn't the blood holy in your veins, Jesus? Because it's the shed blood. Without, there is no remission without the shedding of blood. Not just blood in his veins. I got the blood. That's good enough. Just know that it's in me. No. It's the spirit of the lamb. It's the spirit of self-giving. It's the spirit of pouring out. That's what you eat. That's what you drink. That spirit of, of self-giving. Poured out being of the Lord that we're supposed to be one with and in tune with. Self-giving. The most high blesses Abraham. You know, I don't know if you really understand what that means. Over in chapter 12, God blessed Abraham and said, you know, uh, you know, he gave him a bunch of promises and stuff and said, in blessing I will bless thee and, you know, all this kind of stuff. You remember all that? He blessed him, but it wasn't the Most High that was blessing him. And Abraham sees this thing. He comprehends this priest and this communion that's going on. And he takes tithes of everything that he got and he tithes to this priesthood. Now before that time, Abraham was probably thought of as the greatest man on the earth. <laughs> Not anymore. Now, he's tithing. He's giving. He's saying, and you've, you've read the story. I mean, we can, we can turn there. Look in Hebrews so you can see that what I'm telling you is correct. Hebrews uh, 7. Hebrews 7. And God blessed him. I mean, he left, he left Canaan. God blessed him. He came into the land. God blessed him. He, I mean, he left, not Canaan, but uh, Babylon. And he, he went out not knowing. And he did all these great things by faith. But only in this instant does the Most High come to him and bless him for already communing in that spirit with him. And he just wanted to sit down and make it practical. Just wanted to do that. Um. Chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 5. And verily they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. 
Melchizedek blessed Abraham because Melchizedek was the better. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek because he said, now this, this is important. This is, this is worth giving to. <laughs> I mean, God had blessed Abraham, blessed Abraham, blessed Abraham. All of a sudden, Abraham says, now that's something worth tithing to right there. This most high God, this lamb spirit. Now this, this is important. This is important. Uh, let me just read this sentence here. Thank God that Melchizedek met you and showed you what was important, what was most high, what God wants to commune with us in. Thank God he came and intervened because he just showed up all of a sudden. He just showed up all of a sudden and said, this is, hey, this is a big event right now. This is huge. The Most High sent me here with communion. Thank God he came and intervened. Thank God he met with me, not over earthly victories, over God's power, over gaining great wealth, but over what represents what is Most High. We're running short, and I want to try to finish this. This one who made known the Most High God what a priest. What a priestly work. What a work worthy of being tithed unto. Before that time, Abraham may have been the greatest man in the earth, but now he tithes to the greater. And whatever great work of priesthood that Levi ever carried out, he also tithed to the greater, to the Most High, and to his priesthood. And to his priesthood. That's supposed to be us, folks. Self-giving, communing with the Most High, understanding the Lamb on that throne. This ministry is superior to all that Levi ever did. How will anyone ever discover the truth of Melchizedek and its meaning? I mean, did you see the path we had to take just to get there? We had to stay in the context of the scriptures. We never left the context. We just stuck with it and followed right on through. But people look everywhere and trying to figure this thing out. And they never see the real thing behind it. Men have tried and failed, but the lamb is the key that unlocks the scriptures. Only he will open the book to you. Revelation 5. Anybody know what I'm talking about? John was caught up in the heaven. He's walking around. He's in heaven. For God's sake, he's in heaven. And everybody's crying because nobody can open the book. Well, if I get to heaven, everything's going to be wonderful. No. If you don't have the lamb, you're miserable. You still don't have the key. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? This is, we're not talking about hell. We're not talking about our, we're talking and caught up to heaven and everyone in despair because nobody has recognized the lamb yet. And John starts crying and one of the messengers comes over and says, hey, don't worry. There's one who's overcome, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he turns and looks and it's a little lamb as though it had been slain sitting on the throne. There's the key to the whole thing. And he opens the book. Not now. I want to just make something clear. I'm not just saying that the Lamb is the one who opens revelation to you. I'm saying that if you don't see the Lamb, the Lamb is the key to every part of the Scriptures and the, the key to find the true meaning behind that portion of Scriptures. If you want to know the most high meaning behind it, you're going to have to see the lamb. If you want to see a semi-high meaning, well, that's up to you. But the lamb is the key that unlocks the scriptures. Only he will open the book to you. Without him, it is a closed book. Revelation 5 is not just showing that Jesus must open or reveal what is in the book, but that it is the lamb that is the key. See the lamb, and all else will fall into place. Amen? Amen.
There's your priesthood. There is something that long after sin, in eternity past, eternity future, when there's no devil and there's no sickness and there's no problems, then what? Then just the Lamb and his priests. Do we commune? Do we do it now? Or are we waiting for one day? Do we do it now? Do we pour out our lives? Do we give up our time? Do we, do we end all of the self-righteousness and the pride that rises within us and, and eat the lamb and gladly give up our rights? Knowing. Knowing what? Knowing, like Abraham, take whatever you want, Lot. Just look over the whole thing, take whatever you want. Well, I don't want to join that Melchizedek group, that Abraham group, you know. We could live in a good, you know, place. We could have, but no. But you know what? Abraham didn't give up anything. It was all his. God, just because he said, take whatever you want, didn't change God's mind. God said, I gave it to you. It's still yours. Whatever Lot thinks, whatever he has, it's only those who don't understand the cross. It's only those who don't understand the Lamb who think that they're, you know, this gospel and, you know, this group or any other group that preaches this, this is, you know, they're just, you know, they got a poverty mentality. No, I got a lamb mentality. I'll just try to end with a, a personal story. That property we moved off of um, over there, I'll just, I'll, just I'll, I'll shorten this. I was assistant pastor with another church on that property. And I, I, my wife and I ran a daycare in that blue house that's over there that was on that property over there. And we developed that place, and we put our money and time into it, and we made it one, uh, and this is a fact, and I, you can ask me about it later if you don't believe me. We made it one of the top daycares in this city, and the people who did the inspections loved us. And it's that little door right there that I just mentioned is now in the process of opening another door for us, even now. We're talking a lot of years ago. The Lord told us at a certain juncture we were to leave that church. And so all of the stuff that we had built, bought, put in, curriculum, everything that we had developed that made that the goingest, most money-making thing, it was, it was not only our ministry, because I was assistant pastor, it was our, it was our job, it was our financial basis. And I said, but Lord, what about, you know, should we take this with us? Because we could use it, could we take, and, and the Lord said, no, just leave it all. Leave it all. It's all yours anyway. And so I, so we got ready to go, and I said, we leave it, we bless it, it's yours. We walked off. Well, years later, God opened the door, and we ended up buying that whole property. And the group I was with before was only renting it. We bought the whole property. Many of the, the furniture and stuff we're using around here and stuff, not only that, I still own that house. <laughs> I mean, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> but I'll never forget the day I stood on that curve and looked at that house and looked at all that was in it, and God said, just walk away, lay down your life, and lay down every bit of that, and turned and had no job and had a wife with three young children and had nothing, no visible means of support, just faith that I was trusting God and doing the right thing and being with him and doing it his way. And I remember before I turned away from that thing, I fully, it was just like I just, I just gave it with the most lovely, glorious giving you could get. I give it. Praise God. Let's go, Father, you know, and walked off. And as far as I knew, honestly, that was it. Well, God said, 
The possessor of heaven and earth is the lamb and his priests. You didn't lose anything. And I'm telling you, I know people look at stuff like that and read it like, you know, we're a bunch of idiots and we're a bunch of, you know, we live on less and we, all we talk about is dying. Folks, I'm talking about living. And I'm talking about enjoying life. And I'm talking about being willing to lose everything if necessary and to do it joyfully and heartily as unto the Lord, knowing that God gave it whatever he gave him, either give it back or whatever, that there is no fear in any of this stuff. My father runs the universe. And my, my brother is the most high God of whom I am in that family, that lamb family. He'll gather the sheep from the goats and all these lambs and goats, come on in. All this fighting and butting and biting. Get out. You're nothing like me. You don't know me. You, you might know me on this little level here or there, but you don't know the most high. I need to quit, don't I? Just when I'm getting going good here. Anyway. You want to know the heart of the Melchizedek priesthood? That's it right there. That's it. A communion priest. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back.